Holiday classic or commie propaganda? Welcome back to Navigating Netflix, everybody. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. For this month's episode of Navigating Netflix, we bring someone from the Tragedy and Hope community. It's Bob Brunner. Thanks so much for joining us, buddy. Well, thank you, James. Appreciate the uh, opportunity here to talk about the film. So, again, just a quick rundown of what the show format is. It's something that was started by Tragedy and Hope several years ago as a group chat where people share films and shows and things that matter and sort of why. So we're spending our time watching things that that are worthwhile and we want to kind of share that information with each other because you know we're all watching shows and movies even if out publicly we're talking and fighting the good fight and the news and alternative media and all of that you know we're all still watching shows and and listening to music and all of those things as well so i think something like navigating netflix helps out in that a lot so the idea is once a month we get somebody from the tragedy and hope community who maybe isn't necessarily one of the kind of media creators or content creators that you're used to seeing and that for me is really exciting because I like reaching out and kind of getting with people who uh, I like seeing new faces. So Bob Runner from the Tragedy and Hope community, we're going to talk about It's a Wonderful Life. And before we get into that, if I can just actually ask, because you and I have never really met other than a couple of brief moments we've already been talking as we got set up here on this episode. Right. Um, but just a, a couple of brief words about yourself, you know, how you found the Tragedy and Hope community and and why you maybe want to talk about this film. So I heard Rich on the Jack blood show and he talked about tragedy and hope his website, uh, the book with Carol Quigley. And I had heard Rich's name before with project constellation and his nine 11 experience. And I thought, well, this sounds like a pretty interesting guy and he's onto some pretty interesting things that I want to know more about. And I had found myself after some 9-11 activism um, wanting to know more, knowing that I needed to zoom out and see a much bigger picture here to understand the world that I live in. And uh, the Tragedy and Hope community, uh, I want to thank you and all the folks in, com- in the community that mm-hmm. do, you know, share news, thoughts and ideas. Uh, it's made my life a lot better. So, yeah. It's- Awesome. That's, I mean, I, I pretty much feel the same way, same, same kind of experience. And I've, uh, I think for me, what's, again, what's fun about this is having someone bring the film to the table that they want to talk about. And I, I love that we can talk about something as big, but still as worth talking about as the 1946 Frank Capra film, It's a Wonderful Life. And you can look at it, I think, in some ways, maybe whatever you bring to it is almost the way that you could choose to interpret the film. But I'll leave that actually to you. Uh, Why do you think this is is still such an important film? Well, I'm leaning more towards the uh, idea of holiday classic than communist (laughs) propaganda. But I could certainly understand uh, that angle. Um, I'm bringing this film to the table, just the time of year that it is. And really the the idea, we're so overwhelmed with so many holiday films, so many holiday TV specials, gifts for families, parties that we have to go to, and all of these sorts of things. And for years, this film escaped me. Uh, The holiday blur, um, I always passed through this film when I was going through all of the channels that we get to choose on our direct TV nowadays with our hundreds of channels. And I always saw this black and white film with Jimmy Stewart running through uh, Bedford Falls. And I paused for a moment, but I always kept going. There was always something else on. And uh, finally, I took the time to watch the film. I think it was three years ago. And it just really hit me as... A film that, you know, really drove home a lot of what I thought were some solid ideas that if more people kind of identified with, things might be a little different. And uh, one of the main themes with this movie is each man's life touches so many other lives that when he's not around, he leaves 
an awful hole to fill uh, with all those people that he is uh, connected with. And, and that's a way in some way that it's a, it is a lot like a Christmas Carol. So uh, it's a wonderful sure. life was, was based on a short story that of course, you know, they optioned and turned into a film and Frank, Frank Capra had been making big movies for a long time and this is 1946. So of course it's immediately post world war two and it is kind of a Christmas Carol tale where you're shown what it would be like without you. Right. Right. George Bailey, our main character, um, he lives in a small town and has big dreams of, of leaving that small town and heading out and changing the world uh, in his vision for the better. And, you know, through trials of, of life and trials and error of, of, of life, he ends up sticking around in Bedford Falls, you know, up until the, the end of the movie, throughout the movie, this is where he lives. Um, we're not sure what happens afterwards and I'm pretty sure he, he stays there forever, but he has ideas of, of changing the world. And it starts off where As a child, George saves his son, Harry, who falls into a, um, an I, they're sledding down an ice rink and he falls into the water and George has to dive in and save his little brother and doing so loses his hearing in his ear. Um, and that's something that is played on throughout the rest of the film. Well, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's his brother, um, his brother Harry that he saves and right and it's interesting I, I noticed just in kind of going back over going through the film in prep for this that things happen over water so he saves his young brother from drowning there's also the part where they all fall into the swimming pool, swimming pool in the gymnasium yeah, yeah. and of course we the book end of the film is is the you know the suicide attempt in the water that kind of I noticed that there was this recurring theme of you know things happening over water, but I think also saying you bring you can bring to it what you want. You can come away from it going, God, it's so depressing because all he does is give up all his hopes and dreams, yeah, at every step of the way and things that he that he wanted to do. So if you kind of want to bring a, a more cynical look to it, because he says I don't want to do any of these things, I don't want to stay here, I want to run away. Right, right, for sure. And I don't know about you, but that almost kind of I grew up in in the Midwest and had ideas of a much bigger uh, idea of life and went out west and found my way in Seattle to play in rock and roll bands and had a really good time. And um, now that I'm a little bit older, I'm not saying I'm missing the Midwest, but I definitely um hold those values very close now, you know, um, I'm not sure if that is getting too sentimental here for you. Well, but I, (laughs) (laughs) but I think that's what, I mean, that's what's kept the film so popular and it's, it's worth noting that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a big success on its initial release as so many things that end up being later. Great weren't initially well received. I think that's always a, a, a point we miss to this day. It's the kind of the, the lost things that aren't being heralded at the time that will, will come to, you know, much acclaim later. I, it right. sta- I think they started to just run it on television. They started to run the hell out of it on television. There's been copyright issues as it's been bandied about and been in public domain, yeah. but they still own the book the, rights. In the 70s, the copyright ran out, and mm-hmm. it, apparently it was a clerical error or a brilliant marketing scheme. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But then uh, the television stations had this film that they could play without paying anybody during the holidays. And, hey, why not? Uh, run this film and it I think it, I would have to look to see like how many times it actually got played at you know in that time period but it's definitely interesting that all of a sudden it gained traction you know well and I would wonder if it was again if we go into and we'll include you know some of the some of the things are mentioned will of course of course include in the show notes about uh, we can get into Ayn Rand or or not but 
<laughs> that sure. f- Frank Capra's propaganda films for World War II, Why We Fight, was the name of his series. So coming off of World War II, someone like Frank Capra, who was making movies and who was, I think, a major in the army, right, yeah. immediately turns around and makes, you know, sort of this, you know, feel-good film that again, if you want to come and read it that way, you can look at it and go, oh, well, it's not necessarily commie propaganda. It's almost the, it would be the opposite of that. It's, a, I mean, it's, the film opens with prayers. Sure. Yeah. So again, we you can come our... to it as, it's, it's a very moral film. Not yeah. that I'm, I'm, I'm going off on that tangent, but. <laughs> but I mean, I guess the question would be whether by hook or crook, you know, as it grew in popularity as, you know, the 70s and 80s went on. And there are some weird color colorized versions of it out yeah. there. Yeah. If you're going to watch it, well. folks, watch the black and white one. Yeah. And it may be I it was on YouTube at some point. It may even very well still be on YouTube as, of course, you know, it kind of pops around and that's how you'll see you know at the checkout stand when you'll see all those movies on dvd there for super cheap or vhs as they used to be it's usually because there was some type of copyright issue and they were easier to process sure um but back to you and back to uh your your thoughts on we're talking about it's a wonderful life here on navigating netflix with bob runner yes we are and um so the movie um we talked about George and saving his his brother, um, falling into the icy water and the after sledding, and then after that he's working uh, after his after school job maybe at the drugstore, and he's dishing up some uh, ice cream for one of the, the little girls uh, that work. Uh, that live in the area uh, that has a crush on him. But he notices that his boss, Mr. Gower, I believe is his boss who um, at the pharmacist and he notices Mr. Gower is very distraught and preoccupied. He notices a telegram on uh, the bar counter that Mr. Gower's son had died, um, I believe maybe he got the flu or something in the Mm -hmm. war, influenza, Mm -hmm. passed away. And Mr. Gower calls back George and wants him to run this medication over to one of the people in the neighborhood. And George notices this bottle of poison that is open, clearly marked poison. And uh, I believe the, the pharmacist is so overwhelmed with grief that he's not paying attention to what he's doing. And he rushes George out to go deliver this medication. And George doesn't know really what to do. Um, but in, in, the, uh, in the shop, there's a sign that says, I believe, like, ask dad or dad knows or something like it's, that. It's a cigarette ad. Is that right? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, 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 it's, yeah, it's better. Yeah, better ask dad. Yeah, better ask dad. So. <laughs> It's a cigarette ad. I, I didn't know that. Good catch. And we, uh, the next scene is George going to Dad's office, where we get our first glimpse of uh, Mister Potter. I believe that's our first glimpse. The the villain in the film, maybe the, the Scrooge, <laughs> the, the Scrooge, the Mister Burns, if you will. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, George. George's dad. I'm, I'm not sure of the dad's name. Um, and Mr. Um, Potter are kind of going at it over uh, the loans that um, are due from the uh, building and loan company that uh, the Bailey's own. It's Bailey's um, home. I'm. Um, Bailey's Home and Loan Mm -hmm. um, Company. And then you have Mr. Potter, who is the president of the bank. And those are like the two rivals that are um, dealing out loans in the the city for housing, I believe. Right. 
Yeah. So right? they run they run the cheap they run the affordable place and and Potter's the evil bankster who basically right. has the the tight grip. Exactly. Exactly. So they're going uh back and forth and I don't think George ever gets an answer on what to do with the poison pills from his dad because of this uh, <laughs> squabble that's going on. Um, but he doesn't deliver them to the uh, the intended patient, uh, and thankfully, because that wouldn't have been good. But when he does return uh, to his work, his boss calls him out for not returning these pills, and he says, Mr. Gower, you put poison in these pills. You know, something's wrong. And so it goes to show that, uh, what does it go to show? You well, know, he smacks him around. Yeah, you know, he does smack him around in the in the ear again. Um, you know, frustrated and he's wanting to take out his <laughs> grief somewhere and somehow. Um, it's uh, Ask Dad, he knows. I just, I had to double check. For oh, cigarettes okay. that don't exist anymore. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that that was kind of the the next point in the movie. Um, well, but I think that gets kind of to the heart of the movie because I think you know, again, I think people know kind of the plot by plot, you know, point by point of the, sure. of the film but that it gets to sort of the central part and you in some ways there's a, an epiphany when you realize especially in you know the post you know 2008 crash and the, all of those things you realize it's like oh it's the story of people versus banks that's the story it's always been yeah yeah and in some ways maybe that is a key to its its longevity and that it has resonated with, you know, the the mass amounts of people who need that work together and need to be in that community. Right, right. Whereas the the Ayn Rand part, and she actually was uh, an informant for the FBI on this film, you know, testified the House on American Activities Committee and all of that. And again, we can include the documents and the links and some of the redacted things where they basically now know that it was Ayn Rand talking about the film and is it that it basically pushes this sort of collectivism and communism and is anti-American. Wow, James. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's a fight over the film and it's sort of, and again, I think that shows the power of it and, and Frank Capra studied Lenny Riefenstahl's work of Triumph of the Will and the the films for Hitler. And that's a lot of the ways that he made his films, Why We Fight and things during World War II. So, he, I mean, he knows how to make a damn good movie. Right, right. So I think when it's such a, a powerful piece of work, you have sort of, you have different ideologies sort of fighting for control of that narrative and about why it is important and why you should only read this story our way i suppose sure sure interesting uh like now all these layers are coming off in the film <laughs> that you mentioned that and you know george has this definite struggle of selfish versus selfless uh within himself you know as he gives up all of his hopes and dreams to kind of fulfill other people's hopes and dreams right but I think, and that's what's the, maybe the tough part is not getting bogged down in, you know, dogma and ideology, because I think ultimately the sort of the darker side wants to tell you, you don't need all that stuff. Do your own thing. Go hook up with, you know, and actually, and you mentioned the, the little girl who has the crush on him. She appears throughout the film as sort of the most attractive sort of temptress, if you will, in the film. Right. That right. she, in another way, sort of represents, you know, come on, man, just go do your own thing. Go live. Go, you know, hook up with the girl who's, you know, always throwing herself at you. Right, right. So I think that's, you know, and that, I think that's, again, it kind of shows those fundamental truths that 
we do need community and sort of the manufactured world wants to tell you that you don't and that's why we now have to all work so hard to kind of maintain communities and that's why we've ended up creating communities where we can do these are now online yeah stuff like this yeah um interesting definitely should have more conversations with our neighbors i guess (laughs) It's hard, and I could use that. I could use some of that advice myself. I'm never, I'm not always the greatest with that. But I think, again, that gets to why it's, you know, why this film has kind of resonated for so long. For sure. And the one part at the end that's really nice, um, nice, um, <laughs> the letter that George gets inside the book, uh, No Man is a Failure Who Has Friends. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that, you know, we all can, I think, universally kind of take and kind of feel good about. Right. Um, and another lesson kind of maybe with the film, a lesson, if you will, that the bad guys don't always get punished. Potter never gets Mm -hmm. like caught or thrown in jail for the money that he may have. I guess you couldn't say he stole it, but he ended up with it. Yeah. And didn't turn it in and i did do a little calculation of inflation of oh, the no. <laughs> eight thousand dollars was it uh-huh that comes out to like a hundred and ten thousand dollars in today's money so mm. put a little pr- perspective uh on that amount of money and that would let you get a nice house now and, uh, yeah. maybe half a house <laughs> where you are <laughs> <laughs> So I guess, you know, again, I'd like to keep these new navigating Netflix episodes, you know, a little, a little shorter, a little sure faster, but any other points that you want to kind of bring out about the film? And I know, I think probably a lot of people, if it's something that's just there always in the background, it's, it is easy to sort of go, oh yeah, that thing's on TV again. Plus people aren't so quick to watch boring old black and white movies so people probably do pass it by a lot but any uh any of your kind of closing thoughts on it's a wonderful life well um it's definitely a powerful film and i'll definitely watch it with a new eye uh thanks to james here (laughs) um but i do think uh, you can take some some good messages out of that film and i do think it's it's worth watching um you know, you could watch Elf or you could watch um, Frosty the Snowman animated. Um, what are the other well, like, it's, Christmas it's, classics? For, I think for me, it would you know, it's more you'd have to watch Die Hard. And, <laughs> and right. everyone watches the Lampoon's Christmas movie and the Christmas story. Sure. Yeah. So those all kind right. of compete and run constantly i think on on television now so hey man let me ask you the idea of this show is that each month it'll be someone from the tragedy and hope community bringing a film that their show or something that they want to talk about right but i'm i'm of course it's the holidays as we're talking about it's a wonderful life i don't have one i don't have a film set for next month what are you uh, just off the top of your head because i kind of mentioned at last week any other kind of shows and things last month rather when we were talking with paul verge any other shows any other suggestions uh well i do think you know we have the new um what's the Mockingjay movie. Um, mm. One of those would be good, I think, to talk about. Definitely relevant in today. The new Star Wars movies are out, but I'm not sure if those are actually streaming, if any of those are. Um, I think uh, and movies those like have the a lot of Warriors would be kind of cool. Oh, what's that? You know, the Warriors? Mm. 70s. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Gangs. Yeah. That could be interesting. That would... I'd <laughs> I think out of that list, I would probably pick Warriors to talk yeah. about but they're still they're still making the hunger hunger games films aren't they they are still making them i okay. believe the first well i think the one that's out now is the final hmm. so there's two the two previous are i believe on netflix now and then the current one is in theaters well the that, trilogy okay well that would be the thing to do is now that if they're all sort of made 
to look at yeah. them all as a as a as a whole. That might be the sure. thing to do. So maybe we'll have to look at that in January. And again, Bob Runner from the Tragedy and Hope community. Thanks for coming on navigating Netflix, buddy. I appreciate it. Thank you, James. Appreciate the opportunity. Yep. Happy holidays. You too.